Hey everyone and welcome back to Inside the Bottle TV. I'm your host Sam Patel and today we have a great lineup of uh, some bubbly and Pinot Noir and also the beautiful host Maya Goslin who has joined us who is uh, the owner of Sip Wine Education. And so welcome out to the show. Thank you for having me. Pleasure to be here. Yeah, so tell us a little bit about uh, Sip Wine. So um, my approach to wine education is to make it fun and unpretentious. I find that many people, um, whether they're novices or even wine savvy when they go out to a restaurant or to a retail store can be really intimidated about a wine list or what the store is offering. Yeah. And most people don't like to ask questions because they don't like to feel inferior or stupid when they get a response. Um, and everybody's had that happen to them. So my background is in food and beverage. I've been in the wine business since I was um, very young and I like to demystify it for people. Wow. So this is probably going to be the only episode where Maya takes over as the host, and uh, I'm going to we'll, we'll sit back and, and, and learn a little bit about these uh, wines that we've both chosen. Mm -hmm. so. so we have a lineup of wines today that are themed for Valentine's Day. Whether you are lovelorn or in love, it doesn't really make a difference. It's still February 14th, and you can't get away from it. So whether you're drinking with somebody special or you're drinking alone or with a bunch of friends, we have a great, fantastic lineup here. Um, we're gonna start with sparkling wine today. Bubbles are my specialty. My unofficial title is Bubbly Master. Yes. Um, I've consumed a lot of sparkling wine to earn that title, that degree. Um, well and sparkling wine in general has been off the charts for sales for the last few years. It's increasing exponentially every year. Last year, Prosecco outsold Champagne for the first time, and then even Champagne itself had record numbers for 2015. So you're gonna be seeing a lot more of it in many different styles. Um, the first one that we're gonna do is a style of sparkling wine called Cremant, which is from France. Um, I'm just gonna talk a little bit about what Cremant is versus Champagne. So we all know Champagne, Champagne is the fancy bubbly. Champagne is actually a region in Northern France. Yes. You can't call anything Champagne technically unless it came from Champagne, France, meaning the grapes have to be grown there and produced, harvested under all the regulations of that region. Whether it's vintage or non-vintage, they're very strict about this. They take it very seriously. They and Prosecco take it. is from Italy. Prosecco is always from Italy. So as cava is always from Spain. from Spain. And America, we have simply domestic. We just have sparkling wine. Anything that's gone through a second fermentation is sparkling wine. Ooh. Then when you get into the specific areas, then you get those names, Champagne, Cava, um, and then we have Cremant. So all over France, outside of Champagne, they make sparkling wine, but they can't call it Champagne. You have Burgundy, you have Bordeaux, those are the regions. They make bubbles, but they can't call it Champagne. So what do they call it? They call it Cremant. Cremant is the descriptor, and the region follows. So if it's Cremant de Bourgogne, that means it's Cremant sparkling wine from Burgundy, France, mm. using grapes grown in Burgundy. Burgundy is famous for Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. Now, if you head all the way down to the south of France to a region called Le Moux, this is actually considered by many to be the birthplace of sparkling wine. Um, the monks down there were making bubbly for centuries before the legendary Dom Perignon ever created his famous champagne. And rumor has it that they went down, uh, that Dom Perignon actually traveled to the monastery where the monks of Saint Hilaire were and saw their technique, what they were doing, maybe took it back up to Champagne, France. There's a little bit of um, For all you <clears throat> bitterness <throat> out there. <laughs> but um, champagne is fantastic and phenomenal and it's merited in many ways, but the reason it costs so much money is because the champagne makers charge what they do because they can't. It's a supply and demand. It's a supply and demand. Yeah. Um, those, those big names, uh, they're often not worth the price tag in my opinion. If I was going with champagne, I'd go with a smaller house, a smaller label. But yeah. for purposes of this, we're going all the way to the south of France to have a Cremant from Le Moux. So Gerard the one we have Bertrand. today, the yes. Gerard Bertrand, this is actually a vintage dated Cremant, which is pretty rare to have. Yeah. Um, this is a blend of Chenin Blanc, Chardonnay, and a grape called Mosac, which is specific to the region of Le Moux. Um, this is going to be dry. Brut means dry when you have sparkling wine. Um, that's a descriptor. That is an indicator of how much sugar is in the, um, the second fermentation, how much residual sugar has gone into this. So I'm going to well, open get this. The bottle. Let's get inside this bottle. So I'm going to open this very carefully. Um, I always talk about this. There are about 90 pounds of pressure per square inch in one bottle of sparkling wine. That is really? three times the car tire's pressure. So. When so we all shake back. the bottle up and pop the cork, that's actually coming out. When the cork explodes from a bottle, which yeah. has happened to me on occasion, um, it comes out about 28 to 40 miles an hour. Not right now. 
Right now it's just coming out at a very reasonable pace. Well, it's been chilled now, so. So, and I always start any class or tasting with sparkling wine anyhow, because it's a great palate cleanser. Again, this is brute, so there's very little sugar. This is so, it's dry, meaning our, our mouth is not going to detect a lot of sweetness in here. We're gonna use the fancy glass to start with, although for the most part, I serve sparkling wine in a regular wine glass. But this is very right. pretty. It's a fancy episode. Mm -hmm. It's a fancy episode. I'm gonna let the bubbles settle too. And an interesting point in terms of sparkling wine in general is it has typically less alcohol than still wine. The reason that people feel that, why did the bubbles go to my head experience, is because alcohol travels in the bubbles. So now I've heard uh, numerous times the finer the bubble, mm -hmm. the better the champagne. Definitely, a fine mousse is what it's called. Um, and usually that has to do with the production method, as okay. well as the yeast. Um, yeast is sort of the X factor for sparkling wine, as it is for beer and it is for bread. It's really um, what can make or break a bubbly. Okay. Not just the grapes and not just the quality as well. Um, this, is, this is made in the same method as champagne. That's the great thing about it. It goes through the second fermentation. It's made using the style. You can't even call it the method champenoise. It's called the method traditional. Um, okay. But that because is the same thing. The they can't champagne. use the name yeah, yeah, Method yeah. Champenoise. If you happen to see the word champagne on a bottle of sparkling wine, um, that means it's been grandfather clawed. Which I've seen. I absolutely. Seen there are times. many yes. American yeah. sparkling wines that retail for under $10 that, that say, say champagne. champagne. <laughs> They're grandfather clawed. They've been making that wine for yeah. decades yeah. and were able to prove that it would have impacted their branding in an inverse way. So they were able to keep that branding. Um, but trust me, under $10 is not champagne. It's not champagne yes. <laughs> so, all right, what do we love about this? All right, well, so look at this beautiful. Um, cheers first. Cheers to you, and thank you for joining us. Abs my pleasure. Um, a nice golden robe. Mm -hmm. And you see the bubbles are so yeah. beautifully going up the, up the glass here. So this is, again, going to be dry, a little toasty. Something about the um, Mozac grape that's in here is there's a nice, crisp, acidic nature to it. And this is something that has a kind of a green apple character, I find. Ooh. I definitely get waffle. the green apple. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And in terms of comparing this to a champagne, probably the most similar overall. If you were to take a cava or a prosecco or an American sparkling wine or a cremant, they're gonna this is gonna be the most similar. Again, remember the monks were actually doing this first. First, right. Um, and many a sparkling wine for the most part was created accidentally. They didn't intentionally have their wine go through a second fermentation. Um, it was unintentional. Barrels were exploding because yep. the pressure was building up inside and then bottles were exploding because the pressure was building up inside and then somebody figured out that this actually tastes really good. What Don Perignon that. is supposed to have done is remove all of the, um, the cloudiness. So okay. this is initially so it more refined. Mm -hmm, it's, yep. it's much more refined. So the other fantastic thing about a Cremant is that it's got a t terrific price. So champagne starts in the $25 to $30 mm -hmm. price point and goes all the way up to the, the famous $43,000 price tag that one bottle got at auction a few years ago. $43,000 for a bottle. That's um, crazy. Whereas Cremant begins at $10 and goes up to about $25. And this particular one we're having today, the Gerard Bertrand, is I believe nineteen, about $19. I believe we sell it for around $18.99 okay. or $17.99. Yeah, so it's an under $20 fantastic yeah. bottle of wine. I'm a huge fan of these for an occasion, for something like Valentine's Day um, or as a hostess gift. Great Which, by the way, uh, in a few days is Valentine's Day, so, so definitely you have to stop into your <laughs> local store and pick up a bottle of. Uh, Cremant will be on my list. It is yes. on my list. So now we shall move to the Rotari. Yes. I'll so keep it. This out of the way. All right. So I'm going to talk briefly about Prosecco. This is not a Prosecco. Um, this is from Italy, though. Most of what we're accustomed to drinking, if it's bubbly from Italy, is Prosecco. That's their famous sparkling wine. Yes. Prosecco is made in a very different method than Champagne or Cremant or Cava, um, as well as this sparkling wine. When they make Prosecco, they make still wine. Um, it's made from the Glera grape. Mm -hmm. um, and then they put it into a large 
pressurized stainless steel tank and then it's bottled continuously under pressure. So it's made in larger quantities yeah. and then bottled quickly. So it doesn't take as much time to make Prosecco. That's not to say it isn't good. It's very good. It doesn't have that aged toastiness to it. It doesn't have sure. that added complexity to it yeah. um, that a lot of these sparkling wines, the champagnes and the cremants yeah. have. It's meant to be fun and friendly. It's meant to be drink, drunk with uh, in cocktails, mimosas, and by itself. You know, I and think Prosecco has been our biggest seller in absolutely. our retail location lately. Absolutely. Simply because of the price point. Price and point. also, you know. There was a rumor last year, too, that Prosecco was going to be in short supply. And so what happens when those rumors come up is that everybody is goes crazy goes, yeah. and starts yeah. to buy them before the price goes up. And that actually has since been been um, negated. There's no shortage of Prosecco. So Not to mention, I think we did a video recently uh, with a Prosecco Cuvée Beatrice, which we tried I love with. Cuvée Beatrice. Yes, mm -hmm. which we tried with uh, orange juice as, as uh, mm -hmm. mimosa, and it was delicious. Fantastic. Yeah. So, um, all right, so that's what Prosecco is, but this is not Prosecco. This is um, sparkling wine from uh, the Trento DOC. Uh, this is up in the north of Italy, mm -hmm. um, and Trentino is the area that it's from. This is a blend of Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, yeah. which are the two primary grapes of Champagne. Champagne is usually comprised of Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, and a third grape called Pinot Meunier, which is usually a supporting actor. This is all Chard and Pinot Noir. Um, this is a rosé. So if I like bubbles, I like pink bubbles even more. Um, pink does and not... Awesome, yeah, awesome addition to Valentine's Day as well. Exactly, yeah. and pink, let me clarify this, does not mean sweet. There is no... And I think there's this preconceived notion. Uh, yes. We see pink and we think, think sweet, that sweet, and that's right. the cotton candy effect. But in yep. truth, there's no correlation whatsoever. Pink is coming from the skins of the red grapes that were fermenting. Mm -hmm. um, that any wine that's pink, all, all, you have to take the skin, skin off. The skin off, is right. what makes wine red or pink. So when they make a rosé, they ferment it for a little bit of time with the skin on, and then they press the juice out. And so orange wines, which is this whole new uh, That's completely different. And orange wines, one, right? And so it's 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 That's red, what, it's white grapes with the skins on. Correct. Yes. Right. Yes. Orange wines have a lot of complexity to them. Absolutely, yes. um, they're also very pricey and not widely available yet. Yeah. You would find them much easier in New York, probably, um, Chicago, Boston. Mm -hmm. uh, they're making their way, but yeah. they're the darling of the sommelier world. Put it that way, right now definitely popular. All right, so we're gonna open this one up. This came to my attention this fall. This is a new discovery for me, um, and I absolutely fell in love with it. Again, this is dry, so. Um, there we go. So the glass I'm using, this is actually the correct vessel for drinking sparkling wine. Um, we love the pretty flutes because they're delicate and aesthetic. However, um, you really do want your sparkling wine to open up a little bit. This is not functional, it's form. It has a this really nice pink color to it. Yep. Very hue and uh, I'd say for every take a deep look into this wine tasting that I do, yeah. I have to dispel that myth that pink means sweet. Sweet. Um, absolutely. People have this preconceived notion. And rose, still rose, um, which as soon as April hits, I'm doing still roses. And I would still be doing roses if they were in stock. Um, I incorporate a rose into every tasting I do because they're delicious, they're dry, they have nice spice and fruit character, as well this is um, also. So oh, let's, so you can even swirl well. it a little bit. Smell a little bit. Oh wow. It's a great, great nose to this. This is so delicious. This has nice fruitiness to it, but there's nothing overwhelming there. No, absolutely not. It's you could drink really this by itself, gross. you could have this with appetizers. In general, sparkling wine goes with the whole range of foods. Um, the, the richer, the fattier, the saltier, the acidity from bubbles cuts right through that. Mm -hmm. um, if I was drinking anything, champagne, cava, prosecco, I would have it with fried clams, I would have it with um, caviar doesn't come across my table all that often, so I would probably have it with smoked salmon. Which um, will pair well with the acidity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah. And again, relatively lower in alcohol than a still wine, so you're not going to be overwhelmed by it. Um, so, all right, so let's move to our white wine. Yes. Today. So we stayed in uh, Europe for our first two wines. We were old world. Now we're coming, we're hopping across, to and we're coming California? to the States. Yes. yes. Actually, California for both of these. Um, 
So we're gonna do a white and a red. Um, this is one of my all-time favorite white wines. It's unoaked this as is well. Unoaked. Yes, yes, they also make an oaked version, they which do. is the Mirasolet. It's in Chardonnay. a it's in a clear glass bottle versus the ceramic right. light proof. Right. So um, Chardonnay has suffered a bit over the last 10 years, I'd say, from over oaking that real rich, buttery, high alcohol content profile. A lot of people have sort of gravitated away from. Mm -hmm. um, a, a nicely oaked Chardonnay is a fantastic thing. An over oaked Chardonnay is just too much the oak um, on many people's palates. This particular one is unoaked. So I love unoaked Chards because they are a real representation of the grape itself. What you get is a lot of the character of the grape and then you're gonna have clean, crisp minerality as well. Yeah. Um, for the most part, I'm, I'm a French Chardonnay girl, meaning I like my, my uh, Chardonnays from Macon or Burgundy, mm -hmm. so unoaked or yeah. Chablis. But this one here is um, from Monterey, California, and I'm a huge fan of the Marisley Silver. So, did you hear that? Yes, the Stelvin Enclosure. This is, the chic word we're using is twist off. Twist but off, it's East yes. cap. We, we actually had, we, we spoke of the Stelvin Enclosure in the first and second episode. You did, okay. So, did you talk about why it's become so important? Uh, briefly, we touched on that. So, so one of the problems in the wine industry in general is yeah. the taint that can get into the cork. Um, unfortunately, once the taint has gotten into the cork, it's irreversible. Too many wines are succumbing to the taint um, and too many people are investing in really nice wines only to discover later that the wine has become tainted. It's not poisonous, it's just undrinkable. Mm -hmm. The real problem is that wine doesn't go bad in a day. It goes bad over a period of days. So a consumer might go out to a restaurant or have a glass at home and when wine is in the beginning stages of going off, it doesn't taste so offensive that the person sends it back. Usually you're out with your friends, you're having a glass of wine, you're not loving it, but by the time you've decided you didn't like it, you've had half of it, and then you just finish it. Right, so they still don't know that uh, wine can be aged with a screw top. They do. Oh, they do know. Yes, they are, they are, there are all kinds of long-term um, cellaring studies going on right now. Yeah, Chateau yeah. Margaux in uh, Bordeaux yeah. has been conducting long-term cellaring. Um, it really allows for, right now the priority with the Stelvin, the twist off, is um, one to three years for white wines and three to five for reds. But the studies are, are encompassing wines that go beyond the five-year mark. You want those investment wines, age-worthy age wines yeah. to stand up to time with this. Because there's nothing worse than investing some money in a beautiful case of something fantastic, putting it in your basement for five years in your cellar, pulling up a bottle and coming in. Only for it to go. Only yep. to go. Yep. So this really solves the problem. It's yep. not sexy, maybe, but it does the job. So yeah. that's really all that matters. So let's have a taste of this. Let's get into this. Loving this wine. See how clean that is? Oh, that's very nice. Mm -hmm. Still have this buttery. A little almost, bit. This is a yeah. little warmer um, because um, we had it out for a little bit. In general, though, we do drink our white wines way too cold. Um, the cold only masks the aromas and the flavors. But we do have this notion that it's supposed to be iced, cold, cold, cold. Um, average temp for something like this would be 55 degrees, I'd say, for mm -hmm. this kind of a Chardonnay. Mm -hmm. This is, again, this is an unoaked Chardonnay, so that's what I would prefer mine to be at. Um, this is delicious on its own, and it's also a really nice food wine. I wouldn't pair this with anything too, too heavy. That would go with a, a bigger, oakier Chardonnay, but again, um, moderate white dishes, pastas, maybe even a little cream sauce. Kind of what do you get on the palate? It's very lush, so I get a little more pear. Almost like stone fruit, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Definitely stone fruits, yep. Yeah. And apple. Yep, yeah, I get some apple. And really delicious aromas, and I got a little lime just now. Terminology, though, is so subjective. It what is, what you taste yeah. and what I taste. If I taste yeah. mushrooms, you're like, yeah, but I get smoke. So it's really, yeah. it's and kind I think of. That's the beauty of wine, is mm -hmm. it's so subjective. Well, right? people can be intimidated too by that, you know, where a lot of wine experts will say, yeah, there's cassis in here. And you're like, I don't know what cassis is. So right. it's, I like to use terms like fresh, brisk, zippy, racy, tangy. Sexy, you know, I mean, I use those descriptors because I think they resonate with people a little bit more. Right. You can understand if it's big bodied or light, or it, they just, people like to feel like they get their wine. They don't want Absolutely, to I totally agree with that. Yes. Yeah. So our Very fourth nice. wine here. All right, so now we're staying in California. So these are what we call new world wines. California is obviously the new world. 
New World tends to be a little more focused on uh, science, technology, DNA, testing, um, marketing. There's a lot more social media presence for the most part with a lot of New World. That's not to say it isn't coming over to the Old World. Old World is a little bit more rooted in tradition and heritage, but you also have a nice blending of the two right happening right now where Old World winemakers come over here yep. and bring their philosophies and, and vice versa. 90 Plus is something that uh, it has a great backstory to it. And um, so what I've learned is it is negociant wine. Mm -hmm. So the wine isn't sourced or a state, it's not, sour, it's not a state grown, I guess you could say, right? It's sourced from multiple estates. Basically each wine is labeled under, under the 90 plus moniker and it's assigned a lot number. This is what identifies that winery. Yep. So lot 125 belongs to the winery that made this. So winery 125 um, has produced this Pinot Noir. Which was and rated 90 plus in some publication. They have several point. publications, um, as yes, that have the mm -hmm. 90 plus rating concept because yes. we are ratings enthusiasts in this country. For a fraction of the price. <laughs> For a fraction of the price. So yes, the, the, yeah. the concept is that this wine is still sold somewhere under its own label. And right. then um, it's been bottled here at a significant discount, discount. which is fantastic because... seven ninety nine or eight ninety nine at your store, definitely a must buy. Yes. So the reason we chose a Pinot Noir for today is because it's a fantastic Valentine's, Valentine's Day wine. Um, I find it to be a romantic wine, um, but it's also a good wine to drink by yourself. It's a soft wine <laughs> as well. It's a soft wine. Yes. So Pinot Noir, um, we have been having a love affair with Pinot Noir in America for about 10 plus years. And that love affair stemmed from a little movie called Sideways. When Sideways came out, um, it was about it was a pretty small release movie. There was a, a wine geek named Miles, who's Paul Giacomato, that's his last name, and his buddy, um, who was getting married. So they were going uh, through wine country for his bachelor party. Sure. Miles is a wine snob, and at the time that the movie came out, Merlot was the dominant varietal in America. Everybody drank Merlot. Right. Merlot, and there's a scene in there where Miles has quite a temper tantrum. It's a very funny one. And he goes off and he screams out that he doesn't want any more blanking Merlot. And all he wants is Pinot Noir. And he proceeds at some point in the movie to guzzle the dump bucket at the tasting room and he gets hauled off. And it's it's all it's a great movie to watch. You should definitely see it. But what that movie did, that little movie did, was Merlot sales took a significant hit. Took a significant hit. hit, yes. I remember this. Pinot yeah. Noir escalated, skyrocketed. But Pinot Noir is not a grape to be grown on demand very well. It, it definitely is finicky and needs a lot of finesse to create. This is the grape of Burgundy. If you're drinking red Burgundy, mm -hmm. you're drinking Pinot Noir. So it has such heritage um, and history behind it. And in America, it does phenomenally well. However, you can't plant high yields of it and expect to produce great wines great in a minute. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's what America is so accustomed to. So this is actually an example of a really fantastic Pinot Noir that you can get. It's the only time I'm a reverse price knob is with Pinot Noir. It shouldn't be super cheap. Sure. No, I, because I, it's going to be reflected in how it tastes. Yes. Um, but so with 90 plus, every exactly. I've this, had two lots. This is from a 90 very plus nice. That have been extremely. They're fantastic. Great Pinot Noirs mm -hmm. for the price. Absolutely. You just can't find 7.99 price points on these type of Pinot Noirs. Right. This is because it's not really a 7.99. That's their. They're able to sell it they're for able that to sell price. It for that. Yeah. It's probably a 15. dollars Oh, it's higher than that. This is probably a 20 dollars right. Pinot Noir, I'd say. So to that end, so it's a delicious wine. Let's get into it's, that bottle. It's it's also um, interestingly this is you'll look at look at the wine as I pour it. It's it's very light. However, it has more alcohol than you would imagine. The art of a good winemaker is one who can create a wine that has enough alcohol in it, but that you don't taste it. So I believe you said you talked about legs last time? Yes, so I was just going to get into that. This one has some great legs on it. So what that means is... And so again, it's a, another preconceived notion, I think, when people talk about legs, they get confused of what it actually means, and, and, and it is a, it's the sugar content, and, or the alcohol, alcohol content, content. Uh, and then the density of sugar. So, so the more legs, you can see that. it's going to have more alcohol, more alcohol mm -hmm. essentially. Yeah. Alcohol and water have different densities there. So we are so 
trained somehow all of us have a preconceived idea that yeah. doing this and looking at those beautiful legs means that it's high quality wine it is high quality wine but not because of the legs but, right the legs are actually the legs are known by a more appropriate descriptor which is tears so this is what i would like to see you know, yeah those look much more like tears than they do legs so we've got some beautiful tears here. So you actually yes. do have a, I think this is 14% and 14.2% alcohol. Yeah. Not super high, but you know, it's certainly not, not a, yeah, not a really it's light not gonna be that light right no, around definitely not. But you wouldn't, right. you won't taste that in this mouth. Oh wow. Delicious. delicious? Yes. Absolutely. Yes. This is one of my favorite reds right now. This has delicious, we were saying earlier, bright red fruit on it. Um, what did you say you got? I get a little spice some, on some it. Some cherry. You got cherry? I, yep, mm -hmm. I definitely got some cherry. Um, nothing that dark. No, nothing over it. It doesn't have really yeah. any heavy yeah. tannin character either. And tannins are that, when you have that it visceral reaction. It has a nice reaction, complexity to it, it has too. A beautiful complexity, yeah. absolutely. This is, again, this holds up beautifully with a range of foods. Um, Fish, so what will this pair with? Salmon. Yeah. You could uh, definitely chocolate. I love this with chocolate. Um, it's not overly acidic. It's not overly acidic at all. Yeah. And yeah. again, this is also something you would just have a glass of or a bottle of whatever you want to drink. Yeah. <laughs> However you want to drink it. <laughs> well, we, we are known to get inside the bottle. Exactly. So. Hence yeah. the name. <laughs> Well, it's been, you know, great to have you on the show. I and, had fun. And I think, you know, you've educated all of us, especially myself today, uh, about French uh, bubbly. French, and Italian. And Italian. French and Italian. Yes. And then, and then a little bit to of the California, domestic. And then to uh, Negociant wine, mm -hmm. which has uh, been awesome. I, I love this Pinot Noir. I think uh, I would rate something like this definitely a 90 plus, probably a 92, compared to other Pinot Noirs that I've had. Absolutely. Um, Mercelet Silver, awesome. Yes, Especially hands down my favorite unoaked. domestic yes. white wine. Yes, and I would I would rate this compared to other unoaked uh, Chardonnays I've had around a 90, mm -hmm. I would say, a 90, 91. Mm -hmm. And it's reflected in the price. I mean, this is definitely yeah. a higher and a little bit more expensive. I think it's about 20 bucks a bottle, Yeah, roughly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what that goes for. Rotari, this was unique. This is the first time I've had this. And so, thanks for the recommendation. Mm -hmm. But uh, I really liked how crisp this was. Um, I am not. This is a state yeah. as well. This it, is a this state. Is a state, yeah. state grown grapes. Um, yeah. And it's all sustainable, so there's a nice little backstory to that one too. But what would you rate Rotari? For a sparkling rosé, I'd rate that in the the, high, the 90 plus category. Absolutely. Yeah. And they also make a, a brut that's that's not. As well, um, we'll have to get into that one. Next. And then this is easily one of my favorite. I mean, I obviously chose wines that I yep. personally would recommend. You are the bubbly <laughs> queen, so uh, that one also I would rate uh, Cremant de la Moue, Gerard for trend, mm -hmm. uh, around a 90 as well. And so we've had all 90 wines in this episode. And definitely go out there if you're planning on uh, buying anything for your Valentine's Day significant other. Or yourself. Or yourself. <laughs> and uh, you should definitely pick up some of these bottles at your local store. That's like, well, hey, cheers. Cheers. And happy Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine's Day to you.